Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. Entered at Lake Mason under the tutelage of legendary investor Bill Miller, Samantha McLemore is a student of finding value in corporate equities. Now the founder and managing member of Patient Capital Management, Samantha shares her perspectives developed over two decades and through several cycles of the value factor. Our conversation is an exploration of Samantha's framework, keenly focused on finding opportunity based on valuation and with a long horizon in mind. In Samantha's world, embracing out-of-favor securities allows capital to be put to work when and where others are reluctant to do so and sets the stage for achieving long-term excess returns. In this context, she recounts her purchase of Uber during the early days of the 2020 lockdown, seeing potentially strong upside relative to what she deemed as manageable downside risk. We talk more broadly about the underperformance of the value factor in recent years, as Samantha notes that the high growth segments of the market are in demand in an environment where investors have become less sensitive to valuation. For her, some of these high-flying stock prices warrant caution, especially as a vaccine provides the potential that business as we once knew it becomes more the norm rather than the exception. And in this context, Samantha and her team are looking closely at the cruise line sector, again, embracing disruption and volatility in pursuit of long-term alpha. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my discussion with Samantha McLemore. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Samantha McLemore. She is the founder and managing partner at Patient Capital Management. Samantha, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks, Dean. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we sit here at the end of 2020, a year that I think most of us want to put in the books, one that has brought just a slew of market records in terms of volatility, tons of intervention by the Fed, obviously a public health crisis and very damaging results to the economy. So it's been one to let's say, put behind us. And so I'm really glad you're on with us today. And it's going to be excellent to get your framework for thinking about markets and putting money to work in the stock market. Why don't we get started with just learning a little bit more about your background? Always interested to get a feel for how the guests on our podcast have gotten their start in the industry. Tell us, tell us about the early days for you in markets and how you got interested in finance. I'm happy to. So my first lesson in getting involved and getting a job in the market brought up an important point that's so important in markets that everything is a mixture of skill and luck. And so there was a lot of luck involved. So I was in undergrad. I was in the investment club. I was applying for jobs after the tech bubble burst. So it wasn't a great job market. I thought I was going to go into investment banking because they were a big recruiter at my school. I was more interested in the market for a number of reasons, but everyone said, you can't get a job coming out of college on the buy side. So just don't even try. But I got really lucky because Bill Miller went to my school and they've been trying to get him to come back and speak for years and years and years. And he just happened to come back the fall of my senior year. And so I attended his presentation and met him and he attended the investment club presentation. And I ended up asking him if I could send him a resume. And so long story short, I joined him at Leg Mason as a junior analyst straight out of college, super lucky to get that experience. I thought at the time I would work with him a couple of years and go get my MBA. But as it turns out, I've been there almost two decades or I've been working with Bill for almost two decades. So I feel really fortunate to have learned from him. I think it's an apprenticeship business. And so I've gotten to sit beside him and other fabulous investors and learn so much. Well, what a mentorship that must have been. You say two decades, so that takes us back to the tech bubble and those stratospheric valuations at the turn of the last century into this new one. What are some of the lessons along the way, just in terms of interacting with this legendary investor and learning about his style and his framework for approaching investing? Oh, there's so many lessons there. We could take up the whole time with talk of that. It was really interesting. So when I started, it was July of 2002. And it was at the very bottom of the tech bubble after it burst. And I did a bunch of different stuff when I started. But one of my first projects was 
data wasn't as available everywhere as it is now. So we were doing a number of analytical data projects, just looking at long-term market returns when you had periods as poor as that one was, what was the prospect going forward? And so I was looking at a lot of rolling five-year, rolling 10-year return numbers, especially after poor periods. And two lessons really stuck in my head out of that. One, it's just so much easier to do well and make money over the long term. So the market's up 88% of five-year periods and 92% of 10-year periods. And it's much easier to do well after a poor period in the market. And I think those are two very basic foundational lessons that a lot of people sometimes lose sight of. So buying after the market's gone down and holding for the long term, those are two important strategies. And then there's so many more lessons, but I would say Sir John Templeton used to say there are two types of people, price and value oriented people, and then trend and momentum oriented people. And Bill and I have always shared the price and value orientation. I think that you're just born one way or the other. And when I joined him, we discussed Eastman Kodak, which I had picked for an investment class, which in hindsight was one of both of our biggest mistakes, but it was generating gobs of cash flow. It was down from the market highs. But one of the things that's most interesting, I think, about Bill, which I've definitely learned from, is he was a value manager. But he was a value manager that back then was criticized for investing in some higher growth names. And he had invested in Dell and AOL, and he's invested in Amazon since the IPO. And so some people claimed he wasn't a true value manager. And he would make the point back then that if you step back with hindsight bias and look at any long-term time period, we know with hindsight what the best values are. And if you look at the 90s, for instance, the decade before I joined, it was names like Microsoft or Walmart names that could really compound capital and grow over the long term. And he said the conundrum was no value managers own those names because they, quote, looked expensive on current metrics. And at that time, no growth managers owned them for the whole time either because they were more interested in timing and trying to get the cycle right. And if it looked like they were going to have tough comps and miss on a year, they'd get out. And so no one really benefited from owning those sort of names over the long term. And so Bill always said, why would you create a process that would guarantee you would miss the very best values in the market? And I really took that to heart in terms of a flexible approach that has a valuation discipline, but looks across different types of opportunities. And I think today it's very different. And some of the very best performing managers in the market are those growth managers who own those sort of companies for the long term. That being said, that dynamic, I think, is leading to higher and higher valuations. There's an old adage, probably attributable to Mark Twain, somewhere along the way. It seems like everything comes back to him, but it goes something like, there are no bad securities, only bad prices. I quite like that. I think it really speaks to this notion of what you're paying really matters. I'm curious if you can go back a little bit more to when you started in the industry, because we were coming off this period where value really went out of favor in a way that we've almost never seen it before. If, if you look at some of the price to book type metrics, I mean, they really, that value spread really widened circa 2000. I'm sure almost entirely linked to the internet bubble. But then we had this real good period, I think, for value right around the time you started in the industry. And more recently, not as strong. There's been a lot of questions just around value as an investing factor. But if you could just take us back to the early days in your career as you, I know it goes back a bit, but some of the types of things that you saw, you and Bill saw that were out of favor that you looked at and said, wait, over many years, there's a real good likelihood of compounding very high returns in these industries or these single stocks, perhaps because they're out of favor and the price reflects that. What were some of those back then? It's interesting. I think one thing you talked about is we've had a few of these cycles of growth to value. And I think that that's such an important point. And there's a slide that I have that shows that there's this idea of there's an opportunity to create excess returns by doing something that others aren't doing. And so at various points in time, that was value. And then it generates higher returns. So it attracts more capital that drives the returns down and then capital leaves. And so I think I've seen a number of these cycles 
over my career. And I would say now we're at the point where a lot of capital has left that value discipline and you're seeing all-time great value managers exit the industry. You're seeing Berkshire Hathaway by Snowflake. I mean, you're seeing lots of signs of that being out of vogue. I always think that creates opportunity. So back in the day, when I joined, well, so I joined right in 2002. So that literally that was right at the bottom of the tech bubble. So there were a lot of beaten up tech names that had just fallen from such high levels, many of which didn't survive, failed. And then some of which survived and were really attractive at that time. Amazon obviously being one of them. I mean, it was one of the worst performers in the tech bubble burst. And then it was a great opportunity there at the bottom. But there were certainly many days where people were questioning whether that business, along with almost everything else in that sort of space, was going to survive. There was a famous report where somebody labeled Amazon, Amazon Amazon.bomb. So I think one thing we always look at is what's the sentiment and the behavior. And we know that behavior goes to extremes in markets. And so we're trying to be aware of that and any opportunities that might create. And I'm curious, as again, as we think sort of back through your career, and you've gone through these value cycles, and we've also had financial cycles, economic cycles. I tend to look more at the derivatives markets. And so in that period, let's say from 2003 into 2007, was this kind of leverage buildup, a very low volatility period, ultimately, of course, culminating in this giant crash. And then similarly low vol periods from something like 2014 to 2017 or so. So it kind of comes and goes. And then the interest rate cycle has been something that's just gotten more and more prominent, the actions of central banks. Is there any linkage there in terms of value cycles or the relative pricing of value versus growth? Is it tied from what you've seen to things like excessive central bank activity or very low interest rates, are those related in your opinion? Or what do you see as the sort of driving factors of the value cycle? If we're thinking of right now and what got us here, I think there are a number of drivers, many of which you mentioned. One, if you think back to the story Bill told me, you had this area of these high growth names that drove returns, excess returns for many number of years that opportunity has attracted capital and attracted interest. So you have more people that invest in that way. At the same time, we're going through a period of extreme technological disruption. And so the internet has enabled that software is eating the world, people have said. And so that creates a lot of opportunities for companies and it also disrupts companies. And so I think it makes it harder if you're a value manager who's more focused on near-term metrics to rely on those metrics if they're not a good indication of what the long-term value might be. And then at the same time, obviously, we've had this long, extended, multi-decade move down in interest rates. And so that obviously impacts the justified valuation for companies, and it makes the relative benefit of near-term cash flows less relative to long duration assets. And so that would lead to a relative benefit for growth companies. So I do think that there's a number of macro themes that sort of have led us to where we are today. Yeah. It's almost as if the stock market, at least portions of it, have become an options market where these cash flows that if you can imagine that they'll materialize in a big way in the future, you'll pay up for them now. You say a couple of things here, I think, in some of your writing that I really would love to explore and just have you share your views on this just from an investing philosophy standpoint. So one of the things you say is it's the easiest way to outcompete is to play a game most others aren't willing to play and less competition lowers the bar. In the context of value investing, can you elaborate on that for us? And I do think that's true. We're always thinking about the market's so competitive. It's so hard to beat. It attracts brilliant minds and highly driven people. And so we're always trying to understand what's our edge. Why do we think the market has this wrong? The market's normally, it's really hard to outperform. So I think 
there are a couple of ways that we do that. One, this idea of being long term. So holding periods in the market have shrunk. The average holding period, I think for mutual funds and hedge funds is less than a year. And so I see lots of opportunities that relate around being longer term oriented. So we call it time arbitrage. So the ability to look out and focus on what the underlying fundamentals might look like and call it five years. Ultimately, if we're right, those will drive business values. And so I meet with sell side analysts relatively frequently, and I'll always ask them what their best ideas are. And they'll usually give me one or two names with 20 to 30% upside and a catalyst. And then I'll look on their coverage list and I'll usually see a name with more upside to their price target. So call it 50, maybe 100%. And I'll say, well, what about this name? And they'll always say, oh, well, that one's attractive if you can own it for five years, but it has this near-term uncertainty and I'm not sure how that's going to evolve or what the catalyst might be. So again, if we can be long-term and focused on the long-term and more tolerant of volatility, that's another thing that scares people off. Everyone's trying to get really stable month-to-month returns. And so I think they sacrifice upside in their pursuit of this linear path, which is really hard to achieve. And especially post-financial crisis where people were so scarred and traumatized by that experience and by the losses that it really made people risk and volatility phobic. And so I've found some great opportunities by being willing to get in front of what might be a volatile event. And a good example of that is recently in the last quarter, we bought Uber and some Uber long-term call options. And they looked extremely attractively appraised for me. It looked like the market was only assuming Uber could grow 6% top line going forward. And I just think the prospects are much better than that. That bogey is really low. Those expectations are just too low. And especially as we think about the ride business recovering over the course of the next year as COVID continues to improve. And so we asked ourselves, why Why were we seeing that opportunity? And one of the big things I think was the risk around Prop 22 and AB5 and what kind of volatility that might lead to in the stock. And so when I looked at it from a fundamental basis, I thought the actual fundamental risk was very small because for many reasons, but it was a very manageable risk. And so it might trade down, but that would be an opportunity to buy more. And so as it turns out, those options that we bought tripled in a matter of months as that uncertainty abated. And so I think those are the kind of opportunities you can find if you're willing to be more tolerant of volatility and more longer term oriented. Would Uber be a name that fits in a traditional bucket for value? Or is it something that just from your team and your assessments view of the stock from a valuation standpoint, it was attractive? That's a great question. So a lot of people define value differently. We define value textbook definition, present value of the future free cash flows. And that sort of encompasses all ideas that might be attractive. And so that is what creates value. Now, you might have some challenges estimating those, but our approach is focus on that and look at scenarios. And so I would say Uber fits the definition of value perfectly, but many people who look at, again, shorter term metrics and maybe low price to book, low price to earnings, that's not how they think about value. So people who think about it in that way wouldn't say Uber is value, but I would say that's an inferior way of thinking about it. Right. You found value in the opportunity. From a sector standpoint, and you tell me if this is correct, but two of the sectors that are commonly associated with the value factor are financials and energy. They typically wind up in that value basket. And I'm going back to what you said earlier, which is it's in some ways the threat of a wholesale disruption to an industry. Oftentimes, it's that threat from tech gobbling up competitors, the Amazon effect, those sorts of things. Maybe in finance, it's blockchain and disintermediation. Obviously, we know what the overhang in terms of the energy space. I'd be curious if you could share some of your views on those two sectors. Are those value traps in the sense that they could be so far along in terms of being disintermediated? How do you look at financials and look at the energy sector? 
Those are definitely classic value sectors. I would say when we're looking at any sector, the way I like to think about it is you have two pieces of the puzzle that are really key. You have the fundamentals of the industry, the company. What does that look like? And then you have the expectations baked into the market. And they're really two distinct things that deserve, both deserve attention. And so I don't think it's ever as easy to say, make these broad sweeping comments that this industry is going to be disrupted. What's priced into the stock? Bill and I have had this conversation. Certain companies, and this was true of Kodak back when we discussed it in 2000, it was in decline. And if they had just returned the capital to shareholders, then it would have provided a great return. Some of the problem comes in with trying to sustain an institution that isn't sustainable. So we do think about value traps, but and we do try to think carefully on a company by company basis, because it really does depend more on a company to company basis. And we have a significant position in financials and in, in some of the big banks and some other financials. And we still think those opportunities are really attractive. I think it was one of the most hated. It's now rebounded significantly since the end of the last quarter. And certainly after the vaccine news came out in November and all those sort of recovery value names have done well, financials have gone along with that. But we still think there's opportunity there. And I think that especially the biggest banks, they invest a ton in technology and a lot of these innovations that are coming out on the financial side. And especially the financials we own, like Capital One, it's the first bank that's fully in the cloud and JP Morgan and Bank of America, they've really focused on that. And at the same time, these companies are just fundamentally in so much better shape than they were back in the financial crisis. They have fortress balance sheets, they've de-risked the business, they've taken big reserves and they had to front load those earlier this year because of an accounting change. And it's looking more and more likely that those reserves are greater than what they'll need. And these financials can generate tons of capital, which they will. And as soon as we're through this, they're going to be able to return that to shareholders. And that's a recipe for success for these financials. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities there. Energy is not an industry where we have historically had significant weight. And that's more because that industry has had such a hard time earning returns on capital through the cycle. And so you'll go through these big cycles and we just are seeing this and they'll invest a ton right at the peak. And then those investments underperform and don't earn attractive returns or maybe any returns at all. And so at the end of 2019, energy was the biggest underperformer for the past decade. So expectations had really come down and they're really, they've bounced a lot now or those kind of companies have bounced a lot. I still think energy typically performs well in a recovery. So there's probably some near-term opportunity there. We're spending a lot of time to try to sort through and see if there are any opportunities that make sense on a longer term basis. But again, we're trying to look at companies that can drive attractive returns. I mean, for the first time in a long time, a number of these energy companies actually look like they're cheap on a cash flow basis at current commodity prices. And that's the first time that's happened probably back to 87. So it's starting to get more attractive. You mentioned Uber and finding value in that. And you also, alongside that, said that there are certain issues that they're up against. Maybe they're regulatory type issues. Certainly financials have those types of unknowns. And so does the energy sector. How does your process incorporate those kinds of risks, the risk of a policy change, of a regulatory change, and that potential impact of the business? How much time do you and your team need to spend on those types of matters? Well, anything that can impact the business, we're trying to understand what those risk factors are and try to make an assessment of the impact and the likelihood. And there are some of them that you might be able to have a better sense of what that looks like than others. But we're certainly trying to be aware of anything. And so on the Uber example, it was very clear there was this Prop 22, and it was either going to pass or it wasn't. And you knew what the legislation looked like if it didn't, and you knew what it would look like if it did. And so you could make some informed estimates there. Sometimes it's more theoretical, and sometimes it's more headline risk than real risk. And so I remember a few years ago when the Cambridge Analytica scandal 
hit and Facebook was trading down a lot. And we were traveling in Europe talking to prospects. And we were really trying to figure out, is this going to feed back into the business? And does it have any impact? And we could find no evidence of that whatsoever. So it looked to us like it was more of an opportunity. We couldn't find anyone that agreed with that. And ultimately, that turned out to be the case. Now, fast forward, there's still a lot of regulatory risks to those big tech names. I think that's one reason why they appear so cheap, given their fundamentals on the metrics. So we're trying to understand what that looks like and understand the value of businesses in various scenarios. So this is, as we were saying at the top of the call, the year of COVID and disruption. And I'm curious if you can just give us some perspective on how you and your team managed risk through this crazy and very challenging process for the country, for markets, and maybe stepping back and also just helping us understand what the impact is in terms of security pricing as a function of COVID. Nine months in, what does it mean for the investable opportunity set relative to where we were, let's say, a year ago? It has been quite a year. I mean, I remember, so obviously we're going into February, we were doing well, and then all of a sudden, everything hit. And so we were spending a lot of time in those early days, the market peaked on February 19th, and it had its fastest 35% decline, I think it was, to its bottom on March 23rd. And I remember spending a lot of time as the news on the pandemic or the virus was coming out, trying to figure out how severe was this? What was the risk? Obviously, I think this is just such a great lesson. One of Bill's sayings is how hard it is to reason from the macro to the micro. And I think 2020 is such a good case study on that. I mean, if anyone had told us at the beginning of the year that we would have a global pandemic that would lead to global economic shutdowns, massively high unemployment, a huge number of deaths, everything that we've gone through and that the market would be at highs, would you rather stay invested or sell? I think everyone would say sell. And so ultimately that turned out to not be the case. And so so it's really hard. And as we know, there's a number of reasons for that. And a lot of it comes down to the massive intervention that we've had by fiscal and monetary authorities. Some people think that they say that in a sort of pejorative way that it's artificial. And I just think the counterfactual is just much worse. So they had to do that. And the reason we don't want it leading to a Great Depression type scenario, which was on the table. And so we spent a lot of time during the depths of March and subsequently really on a bottoms up basis. Well, A, trying to understand what was going on and whether there was a liquidity crisis that was going to impair companies' ability to raise capital and finance themselves and lead to some more severe event, and then be on a company by company basis, really trying to understand the implications for their business. And some companies were hit really hard that we own, like airlines. And obviously, it was they started losing tons of money. So trying to understand their ability to survive, how long could they survive? What did we think about the prospects for coming out the other side and whether these companies could make it through. And so we spent a lot of time with our companies looking at it from that way and really focusing on the companies that we had a lot of confidence could make it through this sort of environment, even if it was much more prolonged than people thought. What's left nine months later in terms of the things that you and your team look at from an opportunity set standpoint? I think the good news is the market's at highs or near highs. And so we do get the question, is there a lot of risk? Is there any opportunity left? And I think, again, this market's been very bifurcated between those companies that have been stay-at-home beneficiaries and those that have been hurt by the stay-at-home environment. And we started to see a reversal of that fate this quarter and starting in November. But we still see more opportunity for value names. So Michael Goldstein at Empirical Research, he's a great quantitative analyst. He tracks these valuation spreads that just measure the cheapest companies in the market relative to the most expensive. And so that hit near all-time wide levels in March, five standard deviations above the mean. And looking back, that was only surpassed in the financial crisis and in the Great Depression. And so we were really extended then. It's come in a lot. It had a big move down back to more normalized levels in November, but I still close to one and a half standard deviations above the mean. And typically 
once it starts narrowing, it goes to half a standard deviation below the mean. And so I think we still see from a macro perspective opportunity. And then from a bottoms up perspective, we're still seeing names that we think are attractive, that we think have upside, that we think are beneficiaries of the continued recovery over the course of the next year. And then on the other side, there are a number of names that just look very expensive to us. And they might do fine and they might not, but beginning expectations are very high. So those aren't bets I would be comfortable making over the long term and taking us back to where we started the conversation back in the tech bubble. I think some people assume that the fundamentals will eventually bail you out. And that might be true, but it can be very painful and difficult if your beginning expectations are too high. So if you look at a name like Amazon, which again, has been probably one of the best companies that ever existed. It has one of the biggest market caps in the shortest time since its birth. And in 2000, if you were to invest in 99 and hold it for five years, you would have lost 42% versus the market down 11%. And you would have lost money and underperformed for any holding period less than eight years. And that's for one of the most amazing companies that ever existed that invented the AWS business on top of its core retail business. And so for companies that aren't so stunning, having high expectations at the outset is even more challenging. We don't expect a bear market in the near term, which would take stocks down like that. But I think the longer you have heightened valuations, the more difficult it becomes to make money and outperform. I wanted to get your take on, as we talk about some stocks that could be expensive. Is there any broad takeaway from, let's say, DoorDash and Airbnb last week? I know there's, in, I think it was the DoorDash case, it's only a little bit of equity that's released to the public, but food delivery at $50 billion valuation, I'm no expert like you, but it did sound a little high. Does that say anything about the dearth of opportunity or perhaps that we're in one of these periods where speculative tendencies are pretty high? What Or is there any broad takeaway from those two? I think it's really interesting. I mean, certainly Sir John Templeton, again, I mentioned him earlier, but he has a number of great things. One of my favorite quotes that we use from him all the time is that bull markets are born on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. And I started in 2002 when we were clearly in pessimism, and we've had cycles ever since. But because the financial crisis ended that first bull market from 02 to 07, we didn't really reach a state of euphoria. And now I think you can definitely see euphoria, certainly in the grossier names in the market. If they sell off, they climb back quickly. You can see it on IPOs and new issuances. And I think it was interesting that a number of companies, Roblox being one, decided and a firm being the other decided to postpone their IPOs because of how much those stocks traded up. I think there's just a dynamic of people like high growth companies right now. And there's a lot of people who want to own them and are not valuation sensitive. So that leads to these dynamics where these names can trade up a lot. And I think the more behavior you see like that, the more likely it is to end badly, but no one knows when that might be. And so both those companies, DoorDash and Airbnb, I looked at them a little, and they're both very interesting, very successful companies. So they're exactly the kind of companies that people get excited about in this market. And again, if the numbers are right on both those companies, for these growth sort of names, they aren't that expensive. I mean, DoorDash is trading at 11 to 12 times next year's revenues. And for those kind of growth companies, there are some companies like Snowflake that traded 155 times revenues. So people will pay a lot more than that. But the issue is the market's assuming Snowflake can still grow a lot next year. And so as we recover from COVID, is that the case? Or do people go back to normal and see growth come down a lot and expectations are too high? Again, I think that that's a possible scenario. It's hard to get away as we talk about equity valuations. And in some ways, You're suggesting that this is expensive, but it's less expensive than some other examples. One of the more expensive assets in the world would seem to be a 10-year U.S. Treasury bond that 
has got a nominal yield pretty far below inflation. It feels like it's imparting distortion on other asset classes like equities. And you see these pricing relationships, growth to value, oftentimes is correlated to the directionality of interest rates. I wanted to ask you about the Pfizer vaccine or just the vaccine in general. I want to say it was maybe November 8th or 9th that we first got that news. And it was a bullish day for the market, but underneath the surface was some of the most dramatic moves we've ever seen. A good day for you. (laughs) The value factor outperformed the growth factor by, oh, I don't know, something like 15 standard deviations. I think the KRE, the regional bank index, was up 10% and the Qs were down several percent, things you've never seen before. And so, so many of these relationships seem wrapped around this notion of, the world as we once knew it could possibly come back. And this vaccine being pretty strong, and you can potentially envision a world where people are back to work and they're interacting. How does that fit into your calculus of finding names that benefit from and maybe require that sort of human interaction, whether it's airlines or retail type of stores where the back to work, maybe non-Peloton, non-Zoom class of securities. As you look forward into 2021, what's your outlook for those types of stocks? We do see extreme moves in this market. That's for sure. We're bottoms up. So we're always trying to look on a bottoms up basis at where are we finding the best opportunities? And we're looking at a number of different scenarios going forward. That being said, I think we have thought the likelihood for a continued recovery over the course of the next year is very high. One thing people would say a lot earlier this year, (laughs) I heard it on CNBC just about every day, was the market's so disconnected from the economy. And at a basic level, that's true. I mean, the economy was crushed and the market was back at highs. But actually, if you look closer, it, it wasn't true at all for a couple of reasons. One, the market anticipates the economy. And interestingly, if you look at how the market was behaving, it was behaving just like, and the underlying fundamentals were behaving just like what you would see after a natural disaster. So like Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana, and you have a really sharp drop in employment, but then you have a pretty V-shaped recovery that gets back to baseline within a couple of years. And so that's what we've seen from COVID. And thankfully we had the interventions that we did because that has allowed this to heal in this way. But the market has just basically said, okay. And then at the same time, you've had this very bifurcated market where you've had a small handful of companies who were beneficiaries do fabulously. And you've had a whole slew of companies who were hurt do terribly. And so Bill made a comment early on, I think in March or April, that a bet against the airlines was a bet against vaccines. And so we also saw massive human, unlike anything we've ever seen, human and financial capital being drawn in to solve this problem. And lo and behold, in early November, when the Pfizer news came out, it was strong evidence that allowed people to see the environment changing over the course of their time horizon the next year. And I think I heard Charlie Munger say earlier this week that he would anticipate a year from now things to be normalized in this country. And so if that's the case, I've been looking at cruise lines lately, and I think that they're interesting. And those businesses have been hit really hard. And until you could do the math to understand how much debt they might need and what their losses might be in the interim period, it was hard to get a lot of conviction because there were scenarios where those companies had trouble staying solvent. But once you can see, you have line of sight to what that might look like, it becomes a lot easier to underwrite a number of risks. So I think the market reacted strongly to that. But the market still sees some risks that could go the other way. And so again, we're just trying to understand, no one can nail this timing perfectly. What kind of margin of safety is there? What's the upside? What's the downside if things don't go well? Well, tell us a little bit more about just cruise lines. It seems like an industry where there's a couple of big players, a lot of debt, a lot of operating leverage, but you're seeing at least value potentially given that the economy comes back online fully, so to speak, in a more normal way. Talk a little bit more about that. What do you see there just from a 
What would it take to get more excited about it? And what are the risks that you really bear in an investment like that? It is interesting. I mean, they're still down a lot from their highs of where they were earlier this year. Carnival was at 52 and it's call it 20 today. And that's sort of what you've seen across the space. And it is Norwegian was at 60 and it's at 25 today. And so they're up a lot from the lows. Norwegian was seven at the lows. And so they've been completely shut down. And obviously they were one of the areas of transmission. And so I remember early on people saying, is this industry impaired forevermore? Will people just never want to cruise again because they realize these risks? And so the market has some of those concerns. And then on the other side, again, they're not cruising right now, or they're just starting to have some ships, depending on the company, that are able to sail. And so they're burning capital. They're burning cash on a monthly basis. And no one knows exactly what that looks like in terms of how do ships come back? How do passengers come back? What exactly does that recovery look like? So the question that you need to look at is how much cash are they going to burn and how are they going to finance it? Because some have more equity dilution than others or have more levered balance sheets than others. And so just really trying to get a sense of what it looks like in different scenarios. And then ultimately, what and when do you think you get to a more normalized environment? And if you look at a range of scenarios around that, can you get confident that there's upside and there's good risk reward skews so that you're compensated for any risk that you're taking? So again, these companies have also had big moves up since the beginning of November. Norwegian was at 15, again, it's at 25 now. And you've had the regulations come out from the CDC in terms of what it looks like for those companies to be able to sail. And they're working back and forth with the CDC, but you're starting to get more clarity and the market hates uncertainty. So I think that these could be interesting companies, but it's just a matter of figuring out what that risk reward looks like in different scenarios. Another name that is made its way into your portfolio is Rocket. I'd love to learn more about that business and how you think about it. And it's certainly in a place that's close to home for a lot of U.S. consumers. Yeah, that's a really interesting company. And it came public a few months ago. It came public at $18 a share. It traded up to close to 35 and then it's come back down. It's trading in the low 20s now. And Rocket Mortgage has been around for decades, Rocket Companies. And we talked to a number of knowledgeable people in the financial space. It's such a highly regarded, widely respected company. They've done a great job automating the direct consumer mortgage and building up that business. And the reason people have become concerned or the big concern is right now with rates as low as they are, we're in a sort of peak volume, peak pricing sort of environment. And so people have been concerned about what earnings look like over the next year, if rates go back up, is this company overpriced in here? And I think, one, again, we're willing to take the long view here. And we see a ton of opportunity for this company if we look at over the next decade, call it. So they have a goal to get 25% market share. And they're still only close to eight, despite all the success that they've had. And they have, I mean, most interestingly, a very high recapture rate of business that's refinanced off their platform. So then it sort of stays in the family and it's more recurring revenue, which is really powerful over the long term. And they're just starting to build up more aggressively on the purchase side of mortgages. So we looked at what we thought earnings might be over the course of the next year if rates go up and in a sort of more normalized environment. And we were comfortable that the company had significant upside, even if earnings come down significantly. Now it's done a little bit better more recently because they have continued to deliver really strong results and beat on volume and earnings expectations. And they expect that to continue to happen over the course of the next year. Because if you look at how many mortgages still can be refinanced at current levels that have rates higher, it's a huge amount and it could drive substantial volumes going forward. So estimates have come up. I wanted to maybe shift gears a little bit and get your assessment of technology as it relates to the investment business. So we live in this world where there's more data than ever and the ability to process it 
and harness it is as powerful as ever. We've got effectively computers are reading K's and Q's these days. I was came across something where CEOs are being trained to speak a certain way so that the bots, the AI type of computer programs that are listening and trying to decipher maybe even changes in intonation and try to get an edge, whether they're picking up on something, whether it's word choice or even inflection of words. I thought that was so fascinating and just kind of speaks to how far we've come. So you're telling me the day is here that we're already controlled by robots. (laughs) Oh no. no. (laughs) I know it's something else, but you guys focus on hunting for value and that's a nuanced discipline, focusing on that and trying to find value where others don't. How does the computer potentially encroach on that process? Is that something that you guys have seen impactful to, I don't know, how stocks are valued? Just big picture, what is the proliferation of technology? What's the impact there? We talk a lot about how the market is hyper-efficient in the short term. So I remember when I first got in the business, Sometimes a headline would hit and it, it wouldn't be reflected in the price right away. There was actually an opportunity there that you could act on. Today, that's not the case. I mean, names move immediately. And so any sort of informational edge, especially short term, we're just not competing there. We try not to be at a disadvantage. But one of my favorite, again, back to this time arbitrage idea, one of my favorite things that Bill has said is that in his 30 plus year investment career, it's never been harder to construct a portfolio that you have confidence will do well over the short term, call it six months, but it's never been easier to construct one that you have confidence will do well over the long term, call it five years. So again, we just try to focus on the long term and be aware of what's going on in the short term. It's certainly, I get probably a number of emails every day from firms selling solutions on data surveys and what they're learning from the data out in the marketplace. So it's really hard to get an informational edge, especially a short-term one. It's just hyper-efficient. And there are, like you said, all sorts of things that are working to arbitrage that out of the market. On a longer-term basis, that's where we see more opportunities. And if you look at this year, some of those funds that have done so well historically and are more algorithmically inclined, they've struggled this year in an environment that's kept changing. So again, And they're trading in very short-term holding periods of hours to days. And so I think just trying to focus on something that's much harder for that kind of strategy to attempt to do is what we do. Really appreciate your insights, Samantha. I wanted to end our conversation by soliciting some of your insights on the opportunities for women in our field of finance. You're at a very senior position running a new firm, managing money. There's not many other females doing that. So you're in a pretty strong minority. There are some females on the sell side, of course, but by and large, it remains a male-dominated industry. And that's on a lot of people's minds. I'm curious if you can just share with us some of your views on the initiative to empower women to kind of advance their careers in finance, what's been working, what still needs to be done? I'd love to get your views on that. It's a great question and one that I love. I'm very passionate about this topic. And you're right, there's not enough representation of women. We're a minority. I think 9% of US fund managers are women and only 1% of assets under management, I think, are managed by women and minorities. So there's a long way to go here. I mean, it's great news that there seems to be so much interest in this topic. So that's fabulous. And to the extent people are focused on it, there's a lot of areas for improvement. And it seems like a lot of people are trying more stuff and trying to figure out how to move the needle here. So that's great. Again, I think there's a lot of interest and actions coming along. There's more that we could do there and more that can be done there. And there's just so many interesting things that fall out of it. I think the market are a great area for women overall. The great thing about markets, well, I love that you can learn all the time and that it's always changing. So it's so intellectually stimulating and there's objective results. And so it's not up to someone to decide how you're doing. You get quantifiable immediate results 
daily, which maybe it'd be better if it wasn't daily, but so you can really, you know how you're doing. Others know how you're doing. So that really levels the playing field, I think, for everyone. So I think that's great. I've been involved in some organizations like Invest in Girls, where I taught a class to girls to improve financial literacy and help them build the knowledge that they can have the confidence to manage their financial resources and get involved in markets. And I think efforts like that are so important. And I know a lot of allocators these days are thinking about how do we increase our assets that go to women and minorities. And so again, all of that is such good news. And it's something that really in my career, you haven't started seeing until more recently. That's very promising. And my daughter, Selena, asks me each day where the VIX went. So <laughs> I've got a <laughs> future great. derivatives analyst in my house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. My oldest daughter's nine. And when she was three, so six years ago, I got her on video saying, how much he liked Amazon because Bezos is a genius. Perfect. <laughs> so, and so it's funny. That's awesome. Samantha, thanks so much for being a guest. We really appreciate your time and our listeners will definitely value the conversation today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dean. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time.